welcome to Magic Mike's Castle webcast and podcast. And welcome everybody to Magic Mike's Castle. We have an incredible guest this week, Elliot Hunter. We're going to meet him right after this. Producer and host of his specials on social media based on his magic books of the same name, Dr. Michael, Magic Mike Likey, is also a clinical hypnotherapist and doctor of theocentric psychology. Having performed more than 250 shows a year in the mid-80s and 90s, he also produced and starred in the world's longest regularly produced TV shows in Winnipeg, Canada for nine years and guested regularly on broadcast television and starred in a medieval feast for 10 years. Star of stage and television, Magic Mike Likey performs illusions large and small and will teach you the secrets of the magical arts, both in person and virtually. This is Magic Mike Likey. just a little bit of a taste of our special guest this week, Elliot Hunter, who is joining us via the magic of TV, webcast, podcasts, etc. And uh, I'd like to welcome you, Elliot. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you. And I actually caught you. I was fortunate enough to be part of a lineup um, fairly recently. Um, not Stars of Magic, that was an SAM production as well, but most recently, Flavors of Magic. And I'll never forget, you really stood out. Everyone was amazing on that show. But you really stood out, and you're going to laugh in a minute, probably. Your card manipulations, I'm also talking to... Uh, I, I, uh, let's be frank, there's going to be lay people, I don't like to call them muggles, lay people and magicians watching us as well. And by me saying card manipulations and back and front palming, probably the muggles won't know what we're talking about. But your style reminded me a lot of Jeff McBride, songs, the costumes and everything, but your, your card work, we'll call it, and card manipulations. And then when I went to your website, I saw that Jeff had actually uh, given you a testimonial. There was a quote on there, wasn't there? Yeah. So um, I've been a student of Jeff McBride for about 10 years now. And um, he's really what kind of helped get me into magic. And then um, you saw in the show, that's something I like to feature in my show toward the front is because um, I don't, and, and people say, oh, you're copying him or whatever. And it's like, I don't think there's anything wrong with showing my passion for why I got into magic and allowing that to be first and foremost. And people who know me know that I'm endorsed by Jeff and that I'm a student and he's, uh, he's given me you know, permission to do what I do. And then we've also been working over the years to kind of diverge from that path because as he always says, you have to imitate before you innovate. You, know, you can't learn the piano and then immediately compose original music. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So you, know, you, you start on a certain path and then you work to diverge from that. And I think you saw that in my set as well with some of the custom illusions and stuff that I do as well. So, absolutely. but it's my, uh, it's, you know, and it's why I got into magic and it's one of my favorite routines because I, you know, it's, <laughs> it's what's cool to me. That's what I love doing. I personally don't think you're copying McBride. I, 
uh, when I was watching you, it, f it felt like McBride's style. And there's nothing wrong with being, we'll say, inspired by others. Um, everyone, and, and I know a lot of people out there, both professional hobbyists and, and non-magicians, will agree with me on this. I know a lot of people nowadays, they prefer close-up magic, magic right under their noses. But at the same time, everyone, and I say this uh, unequivocally, uh, or without uh, equivoc, um, which is an inside joke, but um, the, the card manipulations, everyone can just watch and be engrossed and pulled in by this. It's almost hypnotic. And in a way, it proves the magician's adeptness at sleight of hand. And that's just a small part of your show. Um, and, and maybe what, what I want to also emphasize with you is you're not just card manipulations, which in itself requires a lot of skill. Um, we saw a lot of other things in that show. Did you want to share that with us? Yeah, so I think it's important as you're building a show is how can you make it as unique as possible, even if you're not doing you know, original cutting edge material. And I mean, while you can do some of that too, um, I think one of the most important things about drawing a show is to make it personable to you and to tie everything to a story or something that relates the magic in a way that is personal to you. And that makes it a much, much easier and much more personable when you share it with the audience. So if you, if you pull a rabbit out of a hat, you know, what do you do? But if you pull like your grandma's favorite pet from a hat that's been dead for 30 years, now people care about it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Morbid as it sounds. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you can create a story and, and, you know, you watch people like Copperfield, who's been doing this since the 70s. If you can frame your content for a story that is meaningful, either to you or the audience, it becomes much more impactful as real magic versus a superficial, oh, we're going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Absolutely, and I think that's what differentiates in many, many ways magic nowadays versus in the 50s, 40s, 60s even. Uh, is that emotional, what I call an emotional hook. And um, for me, uh, I've been into magic since the 70s, really earlier when I was a little kid. But um, when I first saw Copperfield tell a story, and it was uh, for the lay people out there, it was a four ace effect. Uh, we would call it something else uh, as magicians. But he did on the big screen uh, as part of his live show and television show, he did, um, he shared an amazing emotional story and tied it in to his uh, four ace trick. And I thought, wow, that's genius. That's really, really cool. And a lot of magicians since have, have kind of figured that out or jumped on the bandwagon or whatever you want to call it. And it's like, well, you want to have the audience pulled in. You don't want to just have bam, 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 a series of tricks, which can be amazing as well. But even if one or two effects um, feature some kind of emotional tie or something they can relate to, that I think raises your magic up a few levels, a few notches. And um, one thing, talk about originality. I love one of the things in, in your show without giving away uh, anything or, or too much you have an applause sign and I've been seeing that around lately um, but you've added your own touch I don't want to give it away uh, at all but there there's a neat applause sign as part of your show and I thought well that lends a neat we'll say comedy aspect yeah so um, and I think it's important to improve upon what's already out there as well and how you can make it yours and unique so the applause sign uh, was not you know created by me yes. but it's uh, it was I was one of the first people who got the effect when I first came to market and it's based on a, an old piece of magic called the milk and light bulb in a lamp and, and it uses an applause sign and then over the years I've wanted to take this prop this you know superficial prop and make it something make kind of a character in my show and what you saw in that show was kind of a snippet of the, the grand scheme of things what I'm building out for some content that I frankly can't do on the virtual format, but I think it's important to take something that is superficial and then create something unique and special with it that A is yours and B is something that connects to you in a personal way. And so, um, and then also I think what you saw in that show lends a, a great moment for comedy. 
and it was designed for the Zoom format that way to help build the audience up after teaching them how to applaud in a different way. Absolutely. Um, Very and cool. And for those who don't know, like in a live theater setting, you can clap, you can put your hands together, and that's great. But performers on Zoom in a virtual format can't hear you. So we use American Sign Language to, uh, we A, we teach people the applause sign in American Sign Language, and B, this way we can see when we're getting applause. And so I use the sign as an illustrative purpose for that. And then the, the routine's purpose is to build the audience up and tell them how awesome they are for learning a new way to applaud. Absolutely. You've, you've certainly succeeded in many, many ways. I want to talk, when we come back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about what we call virtual magic. You, other people can call it Zoom magic or magic for the internet or whatever in lieu of live performances and how we've had to kind of bend and and kind of compromise in good ways. We'll talk about that with our guest Elliot Hunter in just a moment. Enjoy Magic Mike Likely's animated cartoons, comic books, CDs, and DVDs available from Amazon. He's also the author of more than 45 self-help alternative wellness books, as well as instructional magic books, all available from Amazon. Published in International Magicians Trade Journals, Magic Mike Likey is a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the Society of American Magicians. And we're back. I'm so excited to have Elliot Hunter, an incredible magician that I was fortunate enough to have met in a group of recent shows we did. And um, Elliot, you're, you've kindly agreed to sharing a little bit of magic for us. So we'll have you take it away. Definitely. Uh, and in this, I would actually like to share a story, the story of how I first got into magic. You see, I was seven years old when a magician came to the public library in my hometown of Anacortes, Washington. And it's a small town of about 16,000 people. We didn't get magicians very often. And this magician came to the library and he did one trick that I will never forget. It's a trick with a white handkerchief. And he promised that he would show, I actually learned this after the show. And it's something that all of our viewers can do at home that you can do if you have some friends to show and a white handkerchief. And what that magician did that day was he took the white handkerchief and he pushed it into his fist. He then retrieved his magic wand, waved the wand over his hand, and it came out the bottom red. He pushed it in the top white and out the bottom red. In the top of his hand white, out the bottom red. In the top white, out the bottom red. In the top white, out the bottom red. In the top white, out the bottom red. I was amazed, Mike. I had no idea how he could do this. I went up to him after the show. I said, sir, how long have you been working on that effect? That was incredible. He said, it's been about two about five years. I've been working on this about five years. And I was amazed. And I was like, sir, what? please, you got to teach me. How did you do that? I said, I'm sorry, I can't teach you. I said, where did you learn? He's like, I learned in one of the books in the library. And that's right where I went. I went right to the magic section of the library book. And I learned that there was two ways you can do this trick. The first way is to take the white handkerchief, stuff it in your fist, then take a big knife and slit your hand down the middle, bleed on the handkerchief, and turn it red. I quickly learned that's the wrong way to do this trick. The right way to do this trick uses two handkerchiefs. The second one in our case is invisible. We'll make it visible just like that. So now we have two handkerchiefs. You didn't notice this, but during the break of this show, I rolled the red handkerchief into my hand and held it in a natural position, making sure not to cause attention to this hand. I took the white handkerchief, and all you're doing is stuffing the white handkerchief in the top of your fist on top of the red one. And then you pull it out, pull out the red one from the bottom. Push it in the top white, out the bottom red. In the top white, out the bottom red. But you never want to do this, Mike. As you can see, and our viewers at home can see, that this looks really bad. No, you always want to keep pushing this in the entire way to make sure that nothing weird happens, and that's always going to be in there. You then retrieve the magic wand and wave the wand over your hand. But this isn't a magic wand, Mike. No, this is a tube of cardboard you get for your pants at the dry cleaners. This isn't even a real magic wand. Our viewers, people believe anything. It's two handkerchiefs. It's not a real magic wand. I'm like, this magic stuff is really weird. 
He did mention to me though that day that you never, ever, ever want to open your hand at this point. Because Mike, if you open your hand at this point, some really weird things start to happen. Whoa. Whoa. That was my first introduction to stage magic. For those who didn't see the visual at the end, um, it was uh, kind of a dyed red and white, half red and white uh, silk handkerchief. One big one with yeah. red and white on it. Looks looks fantastic. That is so funny, yet magical as well. And um, uh, thank you for sharing that, by the way, Elliot. I really, uh, very briefly, as we begin to wind um, wind up or wind down, uh, depending on your perspective, um, um, how are you feeling about this whole virtual magic thing? Because we may have to uh, resort to continuing um, in that genre. I'm going to call it a genre. It's a genre already. Um, maybe for another year or so. So um, are you digging it? Are you liking it? Uh, are you reluctantly adapting to it? And, and how do you feel about that? I mean, I know how I feel versus live performances there's nothing like the energy of the crowd and you one plays off of that but personally i also have like nine years of experience doing television so and i actually love this uh genre as well this virtual magic or, or zoom magic how do you personally feel about it yeah i was really reluctant at first um you know in march when everything got weird i you know i kind of crashed with it i didn't uh, I didn't quit magic or anything, but I stopped practicing. I stopped performing because all of these things in my life that, you know, that made me what I thought made me happy started kind of taking themselves out and it didn't leave me with a whole lot. And I didn't really have the motivation to move on to the virtual format because I didn't think it would represent my brand and represent me as best as possible. And over the summer, I kind of had a mental shift with that. I saw another performer do a Zoom show that I, I kind of forgot it was a virtual show, the way he was interacting. And I saw the benefit through that. And um, I, know you, I know you do this as well by using like volunteers throughout your show. And I've kind of tried to build this in as well. But being able to remind people that, hey, while this is a virtual show, you get a front row seat. I'm in your living room and we can be comfortable. And we can be personable together and not worry about, you know, the person sneezing next to us in the theater. We can be comfortable in our own homes and present our shows. And now people, I found, have their guard down even more. And they're more willing to open up to you in a, a personable sense because they are comfortable in their home space on their laptop that they're on every day. So I saw the benefit through that no one gets a bad seat in a virtual show. And then I created the challenge for myself. How, how dynamic, how awesome of a virtual show can I create? How much of my A material can I reformat for Zoom? Because I'm a stage magician. I do, you know, and I was, I kind of just started putting together my first close-up set. I've been studying stage magic my whole career. And with help from Jeff McBride, I've been putting together my stage set and, or my close-up set. And learning right now is kind of a perfect time to do that, to learn how to format for the camera, do close-up for the camera. But also what kind of stage material can I present on camera as well. That's kind of how I built my studio so that I can present stage illusions on this format and I can cut away and show videos. And I was filming one of my uh, Grand Illusions, a levitation last uh, yesterday with my friend to add to my Zoom show. So how dynamic of a show can I create on this format? And it was something I was really hesitant at first. And now realizing that it may be this way for a while, you know, how great can we make it? Because I still love performing. And I haven't lost that because, you know, we are, as magicians, we are our own best audience. We perform magic so much more for ourselves and those close around us than we do for any live audience. So I started out treating these Zoom shows as kind of a practice session. And then once I see the people on the screen, I see the engagement that I can get from people, then we can kind of break the fourth wall and make it a dynamic show. And then you know, you can still get that satisfaction and you get the thank you emails afterwards. So I think there's a lot of light and a lot of opportunities because this medium also often opens so many more opportunities. Um, for example, I probably wouldn't have met Mike for a couple more years <laughs> if we hadn't done a virtual show together. Um, I 
I wouldn't have been able to do the Flavors of Magic show. I've been doing some other podcast appearances hosted in like India and, and the Midwest and these places that it'd be prohibitively expensive to travel and perform out there right now, especially, but with the virtual format, now that opportunity opens up and you can use this time to connect with as many clients and as many other, um, you know, high paying clients and gigs that you can then do once live shows open up. So I think it opens a lot more doors than it closes, but it took me a while to see that. Absolutely. That's one of the exciting benefits to doing Zoom shows or virtual magic, if you will. And it allows us uh, as magicians to be creative, to be more innovative, to look at our magic, as you were saying, in a slightly different way so that we can adapt it. <clears throat> Personally, I believe it's an incredible time. Um, who has the time or the resources to, to schlep to India or to schlep here or there? I can say schlep because I'm Jewish and from Montreal originally. But nonetheless, um, it's affording us way more opportunities as far as, as magicians are concerned as well to catch lectures that we met, might not have ordinarily been able to catch. Uh, lectures from other pros, lectures from um, you know, all over the world. So it's actually uh, a great opportunity, this virtual magic, Zoom magic thing. I want to thank you so much for joining us this time, Elliot. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? Definitely. I'm one of the easiest people to get in touch with. Uh, my website is ehuntermagic.com. First initial, last name. My Instagram handle is Elliot Hunter Magic with all my double letters, two L's and two T's named after Elliot Bay in Seattle, Elliot Hunter Magic, and then uh, from there, it's easy to find me. Perfect, perfect, and, and those graphics will come up in the, uh, uh, in the show that people are watching. I want to thank you so much. You're an amazing person. Will you come back? 100%, happy to. Awesome, Love. honored to have you, and I'm thankful and honored to have all of you come and join us this day. Make sure you catch us next time for Magic Mike's Castle. Thanks so much.